Uh, it's good to see everyone. Really good to see everyone. I'll tell you, if they go out this time, I'm going to take about a week or two of meditation and prayer and see what the Lord does want me to do. This thing's been going off for a while. Good to see everyone. Thank you for coming. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. <clears throat> I want to read this passage and use it as a springboard for us to begin the lesson tonight. Verse 22, he says this, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Now, we look at that. I wanted to look at that verse, and I think everybody in here would read that verse and say, that's me. You know, I, I'm his people. I'm one of his. We'd look at that and, and think, well, I'm a member of his kingdom. We'd recognize that. And on the outset, I want to say tonight that that is simply a claim. There are many things that would go against that claim individually as, as well as collectively, that we are God's people. There are a lot of things that would interrupt that to say whether or not we are God's people. One of those things I want to look at tonight, there's a lot of things, but one of the things that maybe set the stage for some future uh, lessons that I have in mind is that of culture. Now, the culture that we live in, and I'm not just talking about uh, American culture, but human culture in general. It is a, a humongous challenge whether or not the child of God is going to escape the influence of the culture that they live in. Our culture, I think, has a, a huge effect on being Christians and being Christ-like. And I want to get the same, on the same page, really, as far as that terminology goes. I've heard the comments uh, tonight. We're going to talk about the hippies in the 60s when the title there, counterculture, is. But when I say counterculture, I want to use this definition. A culture with lifestyles and values that are opposed to the established culture. Now, we know as God's children that most of the commandments, most of the things that are written in the Word of God are truly counterculture. We don't have to study very far in God's Word to know that a lot of things that He writes is totally against the culture or society that we live in. Now, when we talk about culture, uh, I'm not saying that those superficial things... When, when, and I, you know, I, I, Japan. In Japan, the culture is, as Daisy is telling us on FaceTime every night, a lot different culture over there. They bow and, and do different things and greetings. And, and we've been kicking around about going over there. I just don't know if I can do it. I, I, and the worst thing that you guys wouldn't need redneck preacher from Sandyville arrested in Japan. You wouldn't need those headlines. I don't know if I could fit into that culture. I don't know if I could adjust to that. And also, when I say culture, I'm not talking about when you're Middle East and you, uh, they kiss each other on the cheek. Not that kind of culture. So when you hear me say the word culture, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things because of where you live, the society that you live in, the culture that you live in, those things that go deeply in your psyche, or those things that go in your mind, and those values that go into your mind that are ingrained simply because you grow up in the midst of that environment. And those things go deep. And they go deep uh, most of the time without us even recognizing it or without us even noticing the effect that uh, it has on us. And really, we really don't recognize that we're from Sarvis Fork till we go to California. You really don't recognize the impact that the culture has on you until you're pulled out of where you live and you're sat down somewhere else. Uh, one of the first times I ever heard the word culture uh, was uh, in boot camp. And we had this class and it said, uh, you don't know, but you're suffering from culture shock. And I thought, well, that's a pretty heavy term, but it sounded right. All I wanted was my mommy. If that's what <laughs> culture shock was, that was fine. But, but I remember that, and really what it did, it set me up out of one environment and put me in another. Now, as we live and breathe now, we're, we're just humans, we are physical, and we really go about our daily activities. And I, I really don't know what oxygen does. Uh, you know, there are some here that does. But, I mean, I breathe, and I go about my daily chores, and I do things, and I'm not uh, thinking about the breakdown that's going down in my body and all the things that's taking place in my body. But if somebody took me and dunked me in the creek and I couldn't breathe, I would start thinking about the effect that that would have on me. Listen, 
I'm in a, an environment that I'm not used to. My body's not used to. I'm having a lot of bad effects, a lot of side effects because of it. So I say that to say, well, yeah, you can understand that in a physical sense. Everybody recognizes that. You change from that, this environment to an environment where fish live, then we recognize that change. But the change as far as mentally and the change as far as spiritually, we sometimes fail to see that and realize that. And I believe it's because the change is sometimes so slow, and I think that's how Satan works, but to admit that it's not a part of our makeup, to say that it doesn't affect us, I think we're on dangerous ground. I think we need to be careful with that. Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to notice a passage, and maybe the passages that we look at, maybe just look at them at a little different slant. Again, there's nothing new under the sun, but I want us to be able to see how culture affects us. I want that to go in. Verse 22, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now as brethren in Sunday night crowd, we know what these words mean. And we've recognized them for years, over and over. We recognize the parallel that Paul's making, all these things. All right? So that he might present the church, it's his bride, of course, to himself. How do you want to present the bride? In splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Because of that, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respects or loves her husband. Now, those words are interchangeable. The, the love that a husband is to have for the wife is to be sacrificial. Uh, my version says respect your husband. Uh, the King James, New King James says love. And really the reason that it's a, it's a different love and what it is, the wife's love, is in response to the kind of love that her husband has. So uh, men, love your wife right according to this, and your wife will love you. It is a responsive love, uh, one that, a, uh, that uh, an infidel has when he learns the message of the cross. That much love, what the Lord did, a little bit what we talked about this morning, that kind of sacrificial love, the only option that I have is to respond to that. I have to respond to that. That's what he's talking about. But now as you look at that and look at those verses, they absolutely run counterculture to our society today. Not so much about the men. And the hus you know, our culture doesn't have a problem. Paul says uh, that the husbands need to be the head of the house and, and all that. But if you look at that, what Paul says to the wives is absolutely counterculture. To look at that and you would say, well, you know, these, this is, you, if, if you believe this, you're a uh, sexist. You, you look at that and, and you're chauvinistic. You're certainly at the very least backwards. You're, you're way behind time. If you really believe this is how a household is with what he's saying, you, you can't be up with it. This isn't it as you look at it. And I use these verses as a problem in dealing with someone who might be new to the Word of God and, and who might be studying the Bible for the first time. All right, let's see how your home ought to be. While you read these verses, the reaction is going to be, are, are you serious? This is how God wants the household to be because never before have they turned to those pages and had a superior being, God, give them the instruction on how he wants a house to be. Husband, wife, children, this is his instruction. Now, if the only thing you've had, the instruction that you've had, is what you have been surrounded by in culture, this is totally against that. All right? See that point. So... There's certainly some other verses, I think, that talk about women in our culture today. Big issue. 
Big issue. We let them vote. Remember that? And after that, it's, the floodgates were open. All right? It's over after we let them vote. Their vote just as good as ours. All right? All kinds of things happened with that. But now as far as uh, what the Word of God says, the role of women and what the, our culture says, what society says, hey, hey, it's out there. And, and you look at that, and I have to admit there's some things in there that he says that kind of ruffles my feathers a little bit. And I think, what well, you know what? I don't know about that. And the reason for that is, is part of our culture. We have been ingrained in gender relations all of our lives, how it's supposed to be out there, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. Now, those cultural views do not stem from anything that God's Word said. And there's a problem with that. There are several problems with when you're talking about our culture and human culture. And the problem is human culture can never make up its mind. This is the year 2013. Let's go back to 1813. I'm an 1813 cowboy in America. I read that passage. I read it to my wife by candlelight. She looks at it. I look at it. There's not a problem. Why is that? Because the culture in 1813, a lot different than the culture in 2013. Not going to get any flack. Why? Oh, a woman knows her place in 1813. She doesn't know her place in 2013. All right? See, what, see the line of reasoning I'm going there? Listen, the lights are on so I can see your faces. All right? <laughs> Don't forget that. Now, human culture is changing, all right? It's ever-changing. Now, let's look at from Paul's perspective just with this text, okay? He's looking at that, and Paul's culture, when he wrote that, do you think that it was anything controversial uh, in 2,000 years ago in Rome? I promise you that it was. And when you look at the text, when you read what the instruction is, did you notice how many, how many lines he wrote to the wives? How many lines he wrote to the men? All right. So now, what does that tell you about maybe a problem in Rome or in the Roman culture and men in general during Paul's day? He wrote a whole lot more just in this big difference. Why? Because in Paul's day, the things that he was writing was counterculture, very countercultural. In Paul's Roman culture, the husband is the head of the wife. In Paul's culture, he is a ruler with a subject. That's what a husband was to a wife in Paul's day. He's the head of the wife, but not as a loving husband, leader, sacrificial. No, no. He was this. You are mine. You will do what I say. I am over you. That was the culture that Paul wrote to. So when he wrote these words, that a husband should love his wife like, he, like the Lord loves the church, who gave himself for it, he's setting up a parallel that is absolutely against everything that those men of that day ever heard of. And what it does is it defines the roles of a man and the roles of a woman in a gender relationship, and it establishes them not as unequal, not as this, but as the same except different roles. And when Paul did that, it blew a lot of people out of the water. And he had, what, what did he use to make that point? He used the Lord's church. He used Jesus Christ coming back for his bride. Those are the parallels that Paul made so that you would see or that they would see the futility of their own culture. Okay? So it's always changing. And human culture is never uh, consistent with time. It always changes. And I look at that, and the Lord's standard does what? what, what key? It never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today. He will be tomorrow. Now I read this. What's good for the first century, believe it or not, those standards are good for the 21st century, no matter what culture you live in or no matter where you live in. When I was... Uh, again, I, I don't know why I always say, I must have learned a lot during those two weeks in South America. I want you to know I'm no, I'm no big mission guy. I just went to South America once for two weeks and I kissed the ground when I came back. I think there's enough lost people in America, I don't need to go to South America and be sick for two weeks. But when I was down there, and because this interests me, 
the culture there interests me, particularly about husband and wife. And the idea there was still here. What was popular in Paul's day about the mindset of a woman's role, a lot different, a lot different. And one of the arguments that I made was, I think sometimes when we go on those mission trips, instead of teaching people the gospel and let culture take care of itself, let the word of God take care of it, uh, we try to Americanize everybody. Listen to it. We just want to do what God's word says. First thing we want to do is make them Americans. Well, they're not, they'll never be Americans. Let the word of God take care of their soul after you teach them the gospel. And we get all hung up on that, and I had some pretty heated discussion with some brethren. And they did it without realizing it, see, want to culturize these people in the middle of the rainforest. Listen, you can't do that. All we can do is teach them the gospel. And really, that's what Paul was doing. But it's a challenge. And it's a huge challenge. And we need to make sure that we don't allow our culture to shift our views or like our, I'm going to run the question or the issue through this cultural filter to see if it's going to line up with what God's word says. We need to be careful about that. Story about Sarah. Sarah worked at a place, doesn't matter. Sarah's not even her name. She worked at this place and everybody liked Sarah. She was a Christian, very faithful Christian. And two women were lesbians. They're going to have a wedding. And they invite Sarah. They like Sarah. Everybody likes Sarah. And they, they, everybody works invited. And they're, they're going to come to the wedding. We want you to come to the wedding. Well, Sarah did not know what to do, how to respond to that. Real good friends. And, and what do you do? So she did this to several friends, emailed several friends. And there were a couple of friends that responded and says, that you needed to go. They advised her to go to the wedding. She was unsure about going to the wedding because uh, what you're doing uh, when you go to the wedding, some of her friends advised, was that you're showing them that you love them as people. That's what you're doing. You're just showing them that you love them and you're, going, and you're showing them Christ-like love when you go. And if you don't go, you're going to shut the door of ever having an opportunity to talk to them about the gospel. You need to go because if you go, you're going to represent the Lord and, and the Lord's love. What is the reason that some of her friends came to that conclusion? Well, it wasn't because they were evil people or wrong people. It was because they had allowed our American culture to twist and skew actually what the love of Christ is. They had allowed the the culture to influence. Now, God's standard for his people really are. It's a dangerous thing. We need to be careful of that. Well, our culture starts determining our decisions and answering questions like Sarah has, then the light needs to go on. John chapter 12. Notice these words. Verse 48. <clears throat> he says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The words or the word that I have spoken, will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Brethren, when God returns to his creation to, re to really determine who his people are, what is going to determine whose people we are is the ones that followed his word, not the words of culture, not the words of society. It's the words of the Lord and the apostles that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. What's been written down, and you look at that, and God's not going to care what my or your cultural interpretation of what the word of God says. You're either doing what he says or you're not. And really, there's no middle ground. And so when you look at the words, as going judge, Jesus says his words. Now, what makes that so dangerous about living in the human culture that we do is that you can allow your focus really to shift. And you can claim the name of Christ just like Sarah's friends. You know when Christ comes, I'm going to be one of his. I'm a Christian. I attend services. I live up to it. All right. And then what happens is I'm one of God's people and you can fool yourself into thinking that you are when the whole time you're bending and mending and folding and thinking like the society that you live in and not following God's words at all. So it makes it dangerous. It's a dangerous thing. Remember Jesus' words are the words that's going to judge us. 
Not what the paper says, not what the media says, not what your neighbors say. And really, that's the challenge. It is a huge challenge because we are so influenced and so ingrained by what's out there. And it happens without us knowing it. This demand that God lays on us against, it really is against the grain. And, and there's a cry that, that we need to stand out. And you know, that's not a new challenge to stand out and to be different. We're told to be different in the Word of God. And sometimes, you know what, in doing that, we're going to offend people. Now, I'm not the guy that goes out and purposely, I want to offend you. I don't want to bring offense to you. The Lord spoke offensive things. The disciples were concerned about that. We recognize that. But to go out and purposely do that, I don't think that's Christ-like. One of the best examples of that, I think when Paul went to Athens and he walks into that city and he sees all these uh, idols and he finally, you know, he, he could have just put on a big smile and said, hey, I'm Paul, the apostle. Everybody here is going to hell and leave. But, he, but he, what he did, he took that unknown God and he started right there with their frame of mind and he began working from that and he was able to teach those there because he did that. I, I, I like that. That's a good example. But sometimes we have to make a stand. And sometimes the words of Christ will offend the culture that we live in. And you need to be ready to do that. Just defend the truth in doing that. But again, it's not new. Look at Matthew 19. Excuse me. Matthew 19. Verse 3. Pharisees came up to him, tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why did then Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Let those words ring in your ears forever. From the beginning it was not so. From the beginning it was not so. Let that go in. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, did the Pharisees test Jesus with this question? What was in their culture? Well, divorce in their time, 2,000 years ago, and why they ask him, it's a lot like America. You know, I mean, if, if you're not getting along, if it's not a, you know, give her, write it up. And Moses said we could. What better authority do we have than Moses? What's the big deal? And so it was culturally accepted that they do this. And so they come to test Jesus on it. Jesus says no. No, because of the hardness of your heart is why it was allowed. You need to recognize that. And that was completely, completely counterculture. Everything that we say in here usually in our classes and from this pulpit and in our discussions, I tell you what, I, I strive to find something that's not counterculture. You know, if, if, we don't, if we come out of here feeling good about our culture and society, I think, who taught what? That somebody must have taught error a lot of times. Look at verse 10. The disciples said to him, if such is it, they couldn't believe it. You kidding me? If such is the case of a man and his wife, well, it's better not to marry. That's too strict. I can't believe that. Why would you expect a man to stay with a woman and if he doesn't love her, she doesn't love him, they don't get along? Listen, it's just too strict. Totally against what the culture was of the day. Jesus spoke counterculture. We do too. We do too. It's totally against from the beginning. And so they struggled with that. In Old Testament times, monotheism, you could worship all kinds of gods in Eastern culture. And the thing about those idols and gods in that day was that uh, those gods, those idols, they didn't care if you worshiped others. And, and the different idols and gods had their territory. And so when Yahweh, God, God himself came on the scene, separated his people for himself, and said, listen, I'm the Lord your God, and me only will you serve. No other gods will you have. This was unbelievable. Number one, that there's just one God. And number two, he's not going to let you worship any other gods. 
But it was rampant in that culture. Rampant. And I read over and over and over again the Old Testament. And, and here we are in the 21st century looking at the Israelites. And I never could understand, you know what? What in the world? Why are you so engulfed and always getting trapped in idol worship? I just don't understand why you want to worship this stump that doesn't do it. What? Can't you get past that? Can't we get past things in our culture? I'll tell you why they couldn't get past it. It was ingrained. It was in them so deep and they could not get it out of them. No matter what God Almighty said, the cultural influence that went in them over those years and in that society they could not get it out of so looking at it I, I guess I can kind of understand how difficult it is for me sometimes and perhaps you when teaching someone they just can't get past what's going on out there and accept what God wants them to do that's the influence of culture so we struggle with culture and it's not unique to the American Christian. This is something that's been going on with God's people forever and ever. Culture. Well, why is that? Why is human culture so inherently, I guess, influential? And why is it opposed to God's standard? You ever thought about that? Why is it such a struggle? Why can't there be a human culture? Wouldn't it be great? Why can't there just be a human culture that says, you know what? You give me the book. You give me what God's word says. and You know what, let's just as a culture, let's see what God says and let's follow his word. There is such a culture, it's called the church. That's where we're at, but it's not out there in society. Look at why I think that is. Revelation chapter two. Now, at Pergamum, there was a problem. Notice what happened. Verse 13. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there that are holding to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak, Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. But therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, what was happening there with some Christians at Pergamum was that there were some Christians there that were teaching other Christians the ways of the Roman culture. That was what was going on. And Jesus paralleled what was going on at that church with Balak, the, the king of Moab, and Balaam. Balaam wanted uh, uh, the king of Moab to, to curse Israel. And he really had, a, had difficulty doing that, but he found out a way. He decided that... Uh, what he would do was he'd come up with a, a way to get Israel the favor of God, and that was tell the king of Moab to invite the, the prostitutes to come and worship with the men of Israel. Now, the type of worship that that was, that was really, it was ritualistic prostitution. They would worship the fertility gods, commit acts of sexual immorality, and they got the camp in Israel to do that, mixed in with that. And you know what? That, you know what? That was going on when the Lord walked and talked on the earth. And that was continuing on when, he, when John wrote this, 90 AD. And, and guess what? That was an accepted form of worship culturally. And really just house prostitution. And, and society at the time said, that's it. That, that's all right. You go ahead and do that. And so Jesus parallels what those that are at that church teaching others at that church saying that that's all right to do that because it's culturally accepted. It's culturally accepted. And in that society, ritualistic prostitution was a form of worship. Go and worship the fertility gods at the temple. And Jesus said, again, this isn't my standard. This isn't my standard. No matter what the culture says, it's not the Lord's standard. But I use this example to, to, to answer that why our human culture so opposed to God's standards. And I'll tell you what, if you read that again three or four times, you see the word Satan in there, that's why it's there. That's the answer. You want to know why cultures are so opposed to what God's word says and the culture 
that God would have? Satan. That's the answer. And Jesus gives that answer. Look at John chapter 12, verse 31. Now for a time here, notice what he says. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will who? The ruler of this world be cast out. Who's the ruler of the world? Well, Jesus said Satan's the ruler of the world. He's not giving him full reign. He's not giving him total reign. And he's not going to give it to him forever and ever. Jesus is going to come back and destroy this. But you know what? Satan rules the world. That's why. That's why. And you can look at that. And, and Jesus admits at that time that Satan has control of the earth. But again, Satan looks at this world and fashions those and a system that he has after the desires of the world. It's easy. It's easy. And it's such a, I guess, and again, a lower standard than what God would have. It's easy to do it. We fall into it. But the difference between Satan, what he does and what God does, Satan looks at the people and lowers the standard. God looks at you and raises the standard. The standard's based on his holiness and his standard of morality. What's well, easier? It's obvious what's easier. Everybody out there is enjoying sin for a season. And what's happening is it's beginning to what? Define the culture that we live in. If we're not careful, our American culture can begin to creep into our minds and we can begin to think of ideas and our views of holiness will begin to be twisted and will begin to be watered down with what the Word of God actually says. You may very well find yourself thinking or hear Christians speak and talk in conversations. You know what? Two men love each other. What's the big deal? Hook up. Get married. It's, it's love. That's what it's about. You mean you're not going to show the love of Christ by, by wearing the name of Christ and going to celebrate a homosexual union? What's wrong with you? Well, you're not a Christian. You see the thought? You see the angle? See how that's going? What's the big deal about getting wasted? It's all in fun. Let's light up. Let's burn one. Let's drink two. What's the big deal? It doesn't matter. It's all for fun. What, what's up? And you start thinking that way, and, and you think, well, you know, what is the big deal about having sex? This, this isn't the first century. You're going to wait till you get married. You're not going to shack up. What? What's wrong with you? You're going to wait till you're married before you have sex? You see how that goes? And you start thinking like the culture that we live in. And that's what Satan does. You absolutely hear people say those things that claim to be Christians. I have. That's why, we're, that's why the lesson. I've heard brethren. Like, you know what? I, I, I just, what? Where's this coming from, Satan? This comes from a culture that is ran by Satan. And boy, he's smooth. And it's just amazing how he smooths that out. But showing Christ's love, being a Christian, that's what it's all about. That's absolutely wrong. That's what it is. It's contrary to what God's word said and God's standard what he says. You know, there's a danger in those opinions. I'm going to shut her down. That makes our culture so dangerous. I love the ocean. And you go out there and you plant yourself on that beach and you walk straight out there from where you planted everything. They made you carry it up half a mile. And you go out there and you're finally in that water and you just close your eyes and you wake up about a half hour later, half a mile down the road. And you got to swim back or walk back to where everybody's at. And what happens is we plan ourselves. But I'll tell you what, if you're not careful, that tow, that current that's out there, it will sweep you down ever so gradually. And before you know it, you've got all kinds of opinions, all kinds of thoughts that are not in here. That's the danger of culture. And just, I'm just like everybody else. How about you? I want to be culturally accepted. Is that your goal? Think about that. I want everybody to like, I'm going to, need to be careful with that. Need to be careful with that. First Peter chapter 1, I'll not read it. And really, he's just talking about a standard of holiness. And, I, and I've got that passage there just to remind us that we need to look in God's word through that lens of his holiness and not the standard that has been set by the world. You know what? I'm proud to be a Christian. I love the Lord. And I'm glad 
that I'm counterculture. I'm glad. If somebody labels me counterculture, if that's the best they can do, I've been called a lot worse. But keep your ears open. Keep your eyes open. Don't bend to the culture that is out there. It's not ran by the one that we serve. If you're here tonight, never obeyed the gospel of Christ, we would encourage you to do that. Jesus is very plain what the gospel is. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. There was a sacrifice made for you, blood was shed for you, that you might inherit eternal life by simple obedience to him. If you have sinned in a way that's public, you want the prayers of this congregation, you want to return to the fold, please come. As together we stand and sing.